everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Welcome to the National Book Festival's teen stage. I'm Jennifer Abella, a copy editor at the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. I'm a huge fan of YA books, so I'm very excited to announce our next guest. Before we get started, a word of thanks to our co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the other generous sponsors who've made this fantastic event possible. If you'd like to add your financial support, there's information in your programs. We'll have some time after the presentation for questions and answers. There's microphones uh, in the aisles for that. Uh, if you do come to the mic, I've been asked to remind you that uh, you will be included in a videotape of this event, so what you say will be recorded for posterity, and it may be broadcast at a later date. It's my pleasure to introduce our next guest, Robin Benway. Robin made a name for herself with her first book, Audrey Waite, in 2008, and followed it up with books such as her also known as series and Emmy and Oliver. Her sixth book, Far From the Tree, which I will admit made me cry, uh, is about three teenagers from different worlds who discover they are biological siblings. It earned her the 2017 National Book Award for Young People's Literature. Uh, she'll be signing books, by the way, at 1 p.m. this afternoon. In all of her books, Robin explores the lives of teenagers with heart and humanity and humor. Please welcome to the stage, Robin Benway. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Into the mic, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is my first year at the National Book Festival and it's 30 years since I was actually in DC. The last time I was here, I was 12 and I was with my dad and my grandparents. We drove here from Connecticut and my grandpa's Honda Civic. He wouldn't stop for food because he was old school. My grandma fed us Tic Tacs in the back seat. And I never ever thought that the next time I would be here, they would all be gone and I would be here at the Library of Congress and speaking at a book festival with the National Book Award. So I'm having a very beautiful emotional experience at your book festival, so thank you so much. Um, yes, I am the author of six books. I live in Los Angeles, California. My most recent book, as you heard, has made many people cry, as they tell me, and it is called Far From the Tree. Um, it is about three siblings, all of whom were placed for adoption as babies. The middle sister, they don't know about each other, and the book opens when the middle sister, Grace, is 16, and she herself gets pregnant and decides that she wants to place her daughter for adoption as well. And in doing so, realizes that she suddenly feels a very strong connection to her birth mother, whom she has never met. And she goes in search of her and instead finds her younger sister, Maya, and her older brother, Joaquin. Maya was also adopted. Um, she was adopted into a family of redheads. It is very easy to tell who the adopted child is in their family. And their older brother, Joaquin, is actually half uh, Mexican. Mexican. And so he was never adopted. He wound up in foster care. And at the point that the book begins, he is 17, about to age out of foster care, and he is convinced that he will never be adopted, and he's doing everything in his power to make sure that his wonderful foster family does not keep him. So, um, like I said, it's my sixth book, and I always thought that it would get easier. You know, the more you do something, the easier it gets. Turns out, like many things in publishing, that is not true of, in the publishing world. Um, each book has been progressively harder, which I was not expecting. And so usually when I talk about Far From the Tree, I try to tell you a little bit about the writing experience of it. Because like I said, it's the hardest book I've ever written, and actually I thought it was the death knell of my career. That did not happen, it turns out. But, <laughs> but I thought that my career was over, and I try to really lift the veil on what it's like to be a writer and how many times you have to start over and over again. I think in our days of social media and Instagram filters, it's very easy to think, oh, you wrote a book and now it's out and now you're going to write another book and it's out. And that's not always the case. And I know growing up, I never met a writer. I didn't know anything about being a writer. So I always tried to say, this is what it looks like. So like I said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a writer. Um, I wrote my very first story. It was one page long in a spiral notebook when I was eight years old. <laughs> and I reread that story more than anything else because I couldn't believe that I could actually see the words again and again. Um, I had a rough time in 
school, I, I don't know if bullied is the right word, but I was very sensitive and I would come home at the end of the day and rewrite my day where I was the hero and the cute boy liked me. And I basically say that I wrote fan fiction about myself when I was, <laughs> when I was nine years old, <laughs> which maybe is healthy, maybe it's not, I'm not sure. But um, I loved writing, but I didn't meet any writers. My mom was a real estate agent. My dad fixed computers. I never had an author come to our school, and I certainly didn't know about any book festivals where I could go hear authors speak. So I was the type A kid, AP classes, you're going to go to college. Writing is fun, and you can do it on the side because you need a 401k. You know, you need a real job. And so I graduated from college, and I became a book publicist. I worked for Random House, and I planned all the book tours. And it was the very first time in my life that I was around authors and I could see they were real people like when I was growing up I thought Judy Bloom and Anna Martin like lived in a house on top of a hill <laughs> like they didn't feel like real living breathing people to me and for the first time I could see authors and so I started to realize that maybe maybe I mean not for me but certainly someone else could maybe be a writer being in this position but I could never actually publish a book I couldn't even finish a short story and but I loved writing and from that job I worked at an independent bookstore love my indie bookstores um, I became a sales rep for a really big textbook company and I was the worst sales rep they ever had and I know this because they told me and they said you are the worst sales rep we've ever had and they were right and I realized that I was just sort of doing, I was circling being a writer. I was doing everything in my power, but I wasn't quite ready to take that step yet. Because the thing with being a writer was that it was my dream. And if I, t it was the thing that got me through all those bad jobs and all of those days stuck at a desk that I didn't want to be there. And I would think, well, one day when I'm a famous writer. And it was the thing that kept me going. And the thing is about taking that leap is that you might lose that dream. You know, if, you, if I couldn't achieve it, what would I have to look toward? And so I was really scared of doing that. And then um, I hit a point in my life where in the course of a year, um, my father passed away, grandmother passed away, and I was diagnosed with gluten intolerance, which isn't as funny as it sounds. Everyone likes to make fun of my gluten intolerance. And um, type one diabetes. So I became insulin dependent all in the course of a year. And I just had a moment where I, like almost like the movies, like the Matrix, where everything just comes into very clear focus. I was like, I, I need to do it. I need to take a leap. I need to quit this job. Sales rep, they were happy to see me go. And I was like, I have to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a writer. So I applied to MFA programs. I'd never had a problem applying and getting into things. Very, you know, again, type A student. Got rejected from all my MFA programs on the same day. So that was a fun day at the mailbox for sure. Um, and I thought, well, I tried. I tried. I, if I can't get into an MFA program, how am I going to write a book? And uh, someone said to me, well, why don't you just write the book? And I thought, but don't you have to go to school? Like, don't you have to, have to get a degree? Don't you have to pay $50,000 to write a book? And they were like, just start writing. So I quit my job. I took a young adult fiction course at UCLA, and I, the very assignment of that class was write a first chapter. And the first chapter that I wrote is still to this day, word for word, the first chapter of my first book. It's called Audrey Wait. It's about a girl whose boyfriend breaks up with her. She breaks up with her boyfriend. He's in a band. He's a terrible boyfriend. It was definitely the right decision to break up with him. He writes a retaliation song about what a bad girlfriend she is, and it becomes the number one song in the country. And at the time I wrote it, I thought, why would anyone ever be famous just for being famous? That makes no sense. And 11 years later, that book feels oddly <laughs> predictive now. But that was my very first book. And suddenly, the dream was happening. And I thought, oh, I did it. You know, done and dusted. Wrote a book, done, out of, you know, this is my career. And then I kept writing, and it started getting harder. And the, the metaphor that I give is you're still on the tightrope, but you just keep getting higher off the ground. You feel like you have expectations, and you have readers, which is the most beautiful, wonderful thing, and yet you, you want to make sure that everyone is happy. You want to make sure that people are still enjoying what you're doing. So I wrote a book about sisters with superpowers. I wrote a spy series. If you ever write books, I highly recommend writing a spy series because the research is so much fun. And I'm sure I have an FBI file now too, but <laughs> it was all in good fun. Um, I wrote a book about parental abduction. Um, by the time my fifth book came out, it was 2015. I had one more book on my contract and I completely stalled out. I 
was in a panic. I was in a blind panic because, just to give you an idea, Far From the Tree should have come out um, June of 2016. It published October of 2017, which <laughs> when you're under book contract with a major publisher is not a fun conversation or several conversations to have. But I suddenly found myself unable to come up with an idea or a story. I started an idea, which I don't talk about because I always worry that one day it will become a book and I don't want to spoil anything. So I had an idea and I was spinning my wheels. And so someone said, you need to get an Excel spreadsheet. I'm a writer because I don't want to use Excel spreadsheets. But I thought, okay, clearly I need a jump. I need a kick. So I got an Excel spreadsheet and it said, you have to write this many words per day, you know, to finish your book. And I was like, great, perfect. Finally, someone's telling me what to do. And I was writing a thousand words a day. So my little spreadsheet wouldn't get read and I kept it in the black. And they were the worst words I have probably ever written in my career. It was like when you're a kid and you have to write a 50 word paragraph or essay and you're like, it was very, 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 very good. You know, you're, it was padding. And I got about 15,000 words into this book and I gave it to my agent who I've known since 2006. So she's brutally honest, which is why I love her. And she said, this is not your book. This is not a good book. You are just circling here. And that was crushing because I had never not completed a book and I had never been able to do that. And meanwhile, my publisher is expecting a book. You know, it's 2015. They should have had a book by this point. And so I went back and I worked on another idea and that one was spinning the drain as well. And I started to make my peace with the fact that this might be the end of my run, that I got five books, what a miracle, I, how lucky am I to have written five books that have been published around the world? No one should be that lucky. And I thought, okay, like maybe I need to make my peace with the fact that this is going to be over now. And um, I called my mom one night, it was five in the morning, and because she's my mom, she answered, <laughs> where most people wouldn't. And I was sobbing, and I told her, I think it's over. Like, I really think this career of mine is over. And she listened, and then she said, no, it's not. And I was like, mom, you don't know. Like, you're not in publishing, mom. <laughs> like, and she was like, no, you're not done. And I said, okay, well, that's, that's nice to hear, and I'm, I'm done. And um, I had to send a letter to my editor and a big email, which was crushing. And I said, I don't have a book for you. I am so sorry. Um, I wanted to give back my advance that they had paid me for this book. My agent said, you're not, because the paperwork is a nightmare, and I don't want to do the paperwork, so you're not paying back your advance. Um, and I, it was, I always say, the worst heartbreak of my life. It was the worst breakup. The idea that this thing I have loved for so long, I couldn't hang on to it anymore. Like, why don't we love each other the way we used to? You know, I couldn't keep it. And it was going, I felt like it was going to someone else who deserved it more. Um, so cut to me in a parking lot in 2015 at Costco with my mother, which is still a thing you do as an adult, apparently, is you're in a Costco parking lot with your mom. And I, um, I was listening to a song on the radio. It was a Florence and the Machine song, if you know Florence, which if you don't, I highly recommend you get to know Florence and the Machine. Um, it was a lyric from her song, Cosmic Love, and it, the line was, a falling star fell from your heart and landed in my eye. And I immediately, and I've heard that song so many times, so many times, and so many times after. And for some reason, that lyric made me go, this book is about adoption. And it made me think of a birth mother having a child, placing that child for adoption, and hoping that somehow that child will carry the love of the birth mother even though that child may never know her. And I owe Florence so much. <laughs> I owe her royalties and residuals because in that parking lot, I grabbed my phone and I typed out the whole email to my editor and I said, this book is about three siblings and their names are Joaquin, Maya, and Grace. It was like they just arrived. They took their sweet time and they finally arrived. And I said, I want to tell this story. I want to talk about adoption and I want to talk about foster care and I want to talk about siblings. I think the sibling relationship is one of the most beautiful and maddening and frustrating and lengthy experiences of your life. And so I wanted to talk about that. And I was like, finally, I have an idea. Great, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write the book. And it stalled out again. And I was writing it entirely from Grace's perspective. The book opens with her having her child by, no spoilers, by page two, she's giving birth, so I didn't ruin anything for you. But she, um, she started telling the story and she was talking all about it and I could not get past page 100. And it was another heartbreak for me. I thought, oh, here we go again. You know, just that sickening feeling of this is almost over again. And so I went back and I read it and I thought, this is so boring. 
and this is the most boring book I have ever written, and this really, okay, so now I was just resigned. I was like, okay, this is over. Why am I dragging it out? Let me just stop. So I went to lunch with a good friend of mine to cry and lament, and <laughs> she said, you should go talk to a friend of mine that he is a foster parent who recently adopted two boys out of foster care. You should go meet with them. So I did. So I met with my, her friend, who is now my friend. I met with his boys, who were seven and nine, eight and ten. And we walked them to karate class, and the dad sat, and he talked to me all about the trials and tribulations and beauty and heartbreak of adopting these two wonderful boys. And on the way back from karate class, the youngest one said, do you want a piece of gum? He meant the one that he was chewing. And I said, no, I'm good, thank you. And then right up in front of my face, a little half piece of chewed gum came up like that. And it broke, it was, ironically, it was such a sweet gesture. And it was so sweet that he wanted to share this. And on the way home, I was like, Grace cannot tell everyone else's story. She can't tell her brother and her sister's story. They have to tell it. The way that these boys have to be able to tell their story to me, Joaquin in the book needs to be able to tell his story. And... I went home and I saw my neighbor who is a painter and he said, how's your book going? Which is a very brave question for someone to ask a writer. <laughs> Tread lightly when you ask that question. And um, I said, well, I think I need to rewrite the entire thing. And he goes, well, that sounds really hard. And I was like, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. And I went home and I tore it apart and I tore Grace's chapters apart and I flipped it and the second I sat down to write Maya I wrote 3,000 words in an hour which is not how I norm just to your just so we're clear that is my not my normal pace and it was like they had been waiting for me to find them in a very strange way sometimes I have found that characters can be very elusive especially ones who have secrets Grace is very upfront about the fact that she had a baby she was the very first person character to start talking to me, but Maya was very reticent and she was very angry. And I started writing Maya's pages and I realized that her mom always had a glass of wine in her hand. Her mom was always drinking wine. And I was like, what's happening over here? Like, why, why are you drinking wine? And I realized that that was Maya's secret, that she is hiding her mother's alcoholism, that she is hiding it to protect her family. And it's slowly starting to destroy her because she is unable to fully enter into her relationship with her girlfriend because she has no idea how to be open and honest with someone. And I... I would have never known that if Grace had told her story. You know, Grace didn't know that in the beginning. And then for Joaquin, like I said, he grew up in foster care. He has a very, very dark secret of something that has happened to him while he was in foster care. And he did not tell me that secret for months. I could not figure out what Joaquin was hiding from me. Um, I should stop and say, like, when I talk about these things, my mom is always like, but they're in your head. Like, <laughs> what do you mean you don't? No, don't you you have to know. And it is a very strange alchemy of being a writer. You you are meeting people and watching them reveal parts of themselves to you. And I feel like I have been on this journey with Grace and Maya and Joaquin for so long. Like after the National Book Awards, my very first thought after like, oh my what just happened was I can't wait to tell them. And they're not waiting for me to tell them anything. <laughs> but when I was researching Joaquin, I read an article that said, it was by, with an actor, an interview with an actor, and he said, every character has something they're trying to hide and something, and the closer that they get to revealing that, that's where the tension comes in. And I really clung to that as I was digging around trying to find out Joaquin's secret. Um, and then I started interviewing every single person I had ever met. If I heard that you were adopted or adopted a child in the time that I was writing Far From the Tree, I interviewed you probably. Um, I talked to adoption attorneys. I talked to foster care parents. I talked to social workers, former foster kids, adoptees. Um, I talked to people who had wonderful experiences and people who had had absolutely horrific experiences. I wanted to talk to every single person because a big part of what was going on for me was, is this, are these my stories to tell? We talk a lot about it in young adult literature, especially whose story are you telling and is this your, should you be telling this story? And for a long time, I tried not to tell this story, as you heard. I did not want to write this book and the book didn't seem to want to be written, but the characters never left and instead they got stronger and stronger. And I had to start listening to what they were saying and finally I realized that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna write a draft I'm just gonna see what happens and if it's terrible someone will tell me I am sure hopefully before it hits Goodreads and social media and I will know it's bad and I'll just scrap it and I'll figure out my next step um, I talked to 
every single person that I had ever met in my entire life. And what I started to realize was that I can't tell everybody's story in a book. And actually, if I do try to do that, the book will not be good. You know, it will try to be all things to all people, and it will not be what it should be. Um, I realized I had to tell three stories. I had to tell Grace's story, Maya's, West, Maya's story, and Joaquin's story. And those were the three stories that mattered the most. And so I tried to make them as specific as possible. Um, and some people didn't see themselves in the book. You know, I've gotten emails from so many people around the country, some of whom loved Far From the Tree. I've been taken aback and also surprised that I'm surprised. From I've gotten a lot of emails from women especially, but men too, um, in their maybe 50s, 60s, 70s, who were forced to, I don't like to say give a child up for adoption, but in those cases, they were. You know, the time and the era of where we were as a country and a community, there was no ability to raise a child out of wedlock. And so I've got emails from them saying, thank you so much, I'm looking for my child, I'm looking for my parent, I'm trying to find, I can't find anything, your story gives me hope. And that, it fills me, I'm very, very pleased that they have found that, but I've also gotten emails from people who didn't see themselves in the book, and that breaks my heart. As a writer, you want to you want to try to give everything to every person that reads your book. You hope that they get a really positive experience from it, and sometimes they, they don't, and I had to sacrifice that for Grace and Maya and Joaquin and for their stories to come through, and I'm just so, I always kind of feel like your characters find you and pick you, and I'm grateful that they found me. I'm grateful that they picked me. I hope I did them justice, and and yeah, the experience of writing Far From the Tree was, turns out it didn't end my career. <laughs> I finished the book's 384 pages. I wrote the last two thirds in about 12 days. Um, I don't recommend that if you ever write a book. A lot goes out the window when you're writing that many pages <laughs> in 12 days. Um, and I gave it to my publisher and I said, here you go. And I started applying for jobs. I updated my resume and I started applying for jobs because I thought, well, this was fun. I, I, Finalized my, I finished my contract. I did not violate any legal rules where attorneys are going to come after me. Here we go. Time to move on. And I'm going to sacrifice being published so I can save my love of writing. Because at the end of the day, if I can't go home and write down 500 words on a Word document or in a notebook like I did when I was eight, what's the point of being published? I just had to hang on to my love of writing. And so I was ready to give it up. And I sat outside in early September, I was at my mom's house, like always, and I was sitting outside and I thought, fall is coming, Far From the Tree is going to be out in a month, I am ready to let it go, Godspeed little book, you know, there's that beautiful poem by Billy Collins, I forget the title, but he says, go out and meet as many people as you can, he's talking to his book, and that's how I felt, like, go. And the next morning, I was in front of my computer, and Lisa Lucas, who is the executive director of the National Book Foundation, she said, hey, the long list is out for the National Book Awards for Young People's Literature. And I thought, oh, let me see if I know anyone. And I clicked, and I was the second name on the list, and I, to this day, like, I start shaking. I can't, my mom came running, because she clearly thought something terrible had happened, and I just, I couldn't talk, and I couldn't type, and I remember thinking, oh, Maybe I don't need to send that resume this morning. <laughs> like, maybe this is going to change. And I became a finalist. And I, I miraculously won the National Book Award, a goal that I hadn't even set for myself. My, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and the only reason I talk about that, because I know there's a lot of younger people in the audience, and I just want you to know, like, when you're doing something that you love, it doesn't mean that it's easy, and it won't ever be easy. I'm working on a new book right now, and I'm like, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> the award doesn't change the process. It's still very, very hard to meet characters and write a book, but I just... I wish I had heard that when I was younger, that it doesn't have to be perfect, you just have to do it. And you can go and fix it, and you will make it the best that it can be. And that is exactly what Far From the Tree was. It was a labor of love that has earned me beautiful accolades and words and emails and letters from people that I'm so grateful for. And yet at the same time, I have to go write another book. And I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm happy to do it, but I've got to figure out how to do this all over again. And if my history is any proof, the seventh book is going to be even harder than the last one, which I'm very worried about. But yeah, I just, if you are a writer or anything, a painter, an artist, whatever it is, it's a hard process. And that doesn't mean that you're on the wrong path. And if there's anything that I could ever impart to anyone, much less young people, it's that, that you, that's the beauty of it. That's the absolute beauty of creating something is that sometimes 
through all of that muck, you find something that's really perfect. So um, I could talk about myself for another hour and a half, but um, are there any questions at all? And I think there's mics set up on either side, if you have any questions. Oh, we have a volunteer. <laughs> what, no. Hi. Um, hi. So um, I loved your Also Known As series. What was the inspiration for that? Oh, that's a good story. So my Also Known As series is my spy series. It is about a 16-year-old safe cracker and lock picker. <laughs> this is a very embarrassing story, but it has netted me two books, so I will tell it. Um, I lived in an old apartment that had a really terrifying basement storage area. It was like something out of a Saw horror movie, you know, that bulb dangling and something skittering in the corner and cobwebs everywhere. And um, um, I was moving out and I realized as the movers were arriving that the, um, I, I hadn't gotten all my stuff out of the storage unit because I hadn't been down there in years. And it had a, um, a master lock like you would see on a school locker on there. So I ran downstairs and I realized, oh, I don't know the combination. I haven't been down here in this terrifying space for over 10 years. So I did what we all do when we don't know what to do is I Googled it. I Googled how do you crack a master lock and 10 minutes later I was breaking into my own storage unit <laughs> with a pencil. Don't use master locks because <laughs> it can be very tricky to break into. Um, and so I thought, well, I kind of felt cool after I did that. I was like, look at me breaking into my own storage space. And I thought, how fun would that be to be a safe cracker or a lock picker? Um, and that's where the idea for the Also Known As series came from. That's why Maggie is a safe cracker and a lock picker. And one of the opening, I think it's the opening line of the book, it's been a while now, but I think her opening line is, I cracked my first master lock when I was three. And it took me a few more years, obviously, to get to that point. But yeah, so that's where the inspiration came from, is me not writing down a combination <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> this writing life, man. <laughs> Hi. Since you've gone through a lot of writer's block, what? Since I know you found it a way differently, like you heard it like out of the blue. But yeah. do you have any advice for people who are going through that, like a certain thing you could try to do? Yeah, I know there's always kind of a divide in the writing community. Is writer's block real? And I am very much on the side of oh yeah, like it is very real. Um, what I find, it's funny. I have found sometimes. I have two blocks. Sometimes it's finding an idea, and sometimes it's writing that idea. And so for finding the idea, you can't chase an idea. You can't. It'll, the idea will only get further away. You know, if I had been sitting in that car listening to the radio being like, this next song is going to be the inspiration, I would probably never thought of that. It just sort of happened. So I think a big part of it is having the faith in the creative process that the ideas will eventually come to you. Um, having that faith is very hard, you know, to be steady that way. When it comes to writing ideas, though, um, I have found that when I am really stuck, it's because that I have either backed myself into a corner like I'm amazed, or that I am very scared and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm very scared of what I'm gonna write next. I have a hard problem every single time I open the Word document, I'm like, this could be it. Like, the, the words might not come today, or worse, the ones I wrote yesterday are gonna be really bad, it turns out, when I read them back. And so I try to break it apart. I try to take my writer hat off and put my problem solver hat on, which sometimes they're the same hat, and I, try to look at it and think, okay, did I write these characters into a plot point that they can't get out of? Is this the wrong way to go? Do I need to back them up and send them down a different path? Or do I just need to get over myself and write a thousand words and let them all be terrible and delete them all out tomorrow, but for now I'm just going to write those words? And sometimes it's kicking myself in the butt, and sometimes it's looking at the characters and figuring it out, but yeah, and sometimes you just got to be really nice to yourself, too. Like, writing is hard, and it's lonely sometimes, and you're with imaginary people all day long <laughs> that sometimes don't give you what you want, and so sometimes you have to go for a walk or listen to music or talk to a friend or pet your dog or... You know, just sometimes get out of that writer space and just tell yourself that maybe today isn't the right day, but tomorrow could be the right day. Yeah, it's oh, there's a whole bunch of tools in my bag that I try to use to break down writer's block, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Hi. Hi. Uh, first off, I just want to tell you, like, getting through, like, the writer's block and, like, all these obstacles you had to go through, especially with going far from the tree, has been, like, super inspiring. Oh, okay. thank you. Now <laughs> to the question. Um, how do you know that an idea that you have is going to be a good one and mm. it's going to follow into like a story that is like cohesive and real and that can actually be made to a book. Usually, and this is what I found while writing all the precursors to Far From the Tree was these, I, I didn't know the characters in the books that I was writing and I was 15, 20,000 words in and I was still like, what is their point? Like, what are they, 
what does she want? Why is she doing this? And I couldn't, I couldn't meet her. You know, I just couldn't figure out who this person was. And I feel like that was a very big sign to me. When I know that an idea is working, it's when the characters start doing things that I was not expecting. And they sort of take on a life of their own. And again, my mom's like, what do you mean you didn't know what they were gonna do? And the example of like Maya's mom drinking, you know, that was not a plot point at all in any of the initial thoughts that I had about the book. And they reveal things in that way that is so surprising. It's like they trust you enough to let you see a door into their life. And it's, that's when I'm like, okay, this might be working. This might be working. And sometimes you don't know till page 200, but what else are you going to do? Just keep trying to meet them and keep trying to write them. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, do you find uh, like writing down ideas harder or just like finding the ideas in your head or oh. inspiration? You mean like once I, do I find it hard to write, write ideas down or to find the ideas? I find it much harder to find the idea. I have some friends that have a notebook full of 12 ideas. Like one of my friends was like, yeah, I have an idea due to my publisher. So I'm going to go through my notebook. And I was like, you have a notebook of ideas? Where do you get one of those? <laughs> like, can I get one? Um, yeah, I don't get very many ideas. Um, and when they do, it's sort of like, like I was saying, like how... Will this be a book? Maybe it's just an idea of a book. I just got one a couple months ago, and it slowly started to happen in my head, but I don't like to write them down because I feel like once I write them down, to me, before I'm ready to start writing the book, they lose a little bit of their magic. I really love the idea of having that idea and just sitting with it and, you know, while you're driving around or talking to someone or walking the dog, you know, you sort of, I let those ideas kind of just roll around in my head and they start to maybe get a little bit bigger and a little bit more complex. And then I don't write anything down. I'm not an outliner. I write entirely by the seat of my pants and we'll just see what happens, you know, sit down and it's me and the characters and hopefully we'll all get along that day. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It seems like many times. <laughs> <laughs> It's a low mic. That's right. Uh, it takes a while for the characters to come to you. Yes. And then after that, you spend a great deal of time with them, and you, and you have these emotions and connections that develop yeah. over the time. But how do you know when it's time to let go and that the book is done and you've told their story? That is an excellent question. How do you know when the book is done? Um, I think as a writer, to me, it's never done. You know, I always want to keep going, not only refining, but I just kind of want to follow them sometimes and see... What are you guys going to go to college? Are you going to go to college? Like, um, I feel like I always know the very, very, very end of the book. For some reason, I always know the very beginning and the very end. And the last three words of Far From the Tree are very emotional for people. And I knew those last three words when I first started writing the first three words of Far From the Tree. So I kind of use that as, our, as my goal goal a sports metaphor. Like, I think those, I kind of try to use those as my buffers and think, okay, right to this end scene. Um, I feel like once you answer the character's questions, you know, once you put their story on the page, I have found that it sort of dries up. There's, there's nothing more I could have put into Far From the Tree. Like, I felt like everything that people needed to know about those three characters, they knew. And to add any more would just be for me. It would just be selfish, you know? Like, I can go write fan fiction about my characters on my own time, but the book didn't need those facts. And you find it through editing sometimes, you find it through drafting, you find it because your editor goes, cut these 200 pages, these are unnecessary. You know, it's sometimes a community effort. Um, but I feel like a lot of writing is trusting your instinct and that would be a good example of that. And honing it over time as well. Yeah. So I was wondering, you were talking about how you don't write any ideas down. Do you ever worry about losing your idea completely? Because no, because there's so few to round up. So. <laughs> it's not like trying to herd cats, you know, where they're all over the place. Oh, the dream to have that many ideas. But no, um, I, I don't worry about losing them because, again, they're so few and far between that they tend to become books. And I feel like if I did lose an idea, then it wasn't meant to be a book in the first place. You know, if it was supposed to stick around, it would have. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, I noticed that you, when you were talking about your characters going through foster care, that you didn't necessarily have that own personal experience. Yeah. So 
how do you make it okay for you to tell that story? How do you go about deciding and making that decision? I talk to a lot of foster kids. I talk to a lot of foster parents. I talk to social workers. Um, I tried to make stories as specific as possible. Um, it was hard. That, and the fact that Joaquin is half Mexican was incredibly scary for me to write. Um, I think I gave it to beta readers. I gave it to friends. I gave it to people who knew what I was trying to do. And I feel like at the end of the day, you just have to hope that you gave it your best, not only with your brain, but with your heart as well. And that people will be able to see themselves. And not, again, not everyone will be. And it's sometimes that leap of faith, again, of being a writer. You hope that you were good enough. And I think in some cases, I was, yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I am being told to wrap it up. So thank you so, so much for excellent questions and for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you.